So today we are joined by Jess Herbetes, Regulatory Analyst with North Slave Lake Métis Alliance. I'd also like to welcome NSMA member Melissa McClellan uh, to the call as well. And we're going to hear from a couple other NSMA members who weren't able to join us live, but did send their thoughts in for this presentation. Uh, in the webinar, we'll be discussing climate change impacts in the North, the relationship between Western science and Indigenous knowledge systems, and current environmental stewardship projects in the North Slave Lake region. All right, Jess, you have control of the webinar screen, so you should be able to start your presentation. All right, everyone. Thank you so much for joining in in our webinar today. Um, it's a pretty unprecedented time, I think. It's, it's weird being on these Zoom platforms, but um, on the plus side, we get to have these really cool collaborations between high schoolers in the NWT as well as in Ontario. Um, so uh, we'll start off, um, we'll do some introductions and then we'll get right into the meat of our presentation. Um, I will say, I just wanted to give a quick warning before we start uh, that this presentation does speak to harvesting and hunting of wildlife. And uh, one of our slides includes a picture of one of our members, Chloe, during one of her hunts um, that has animals that she harvested. This is a pretty common occurrence in the North, but we recognize that not all students um, are exposed to these practices. So just wanted to give you a little heads up. So who is our lovely group? So there's, uh, there was planned to be four panelists here today, um, three members joining me in presentation. Unfortunately, Al and Chloe had some last minute engagements that have kept them away. And um, I will be introducing them, but their thoughts and stories as well as a wonderful audio clip will be in the presentation today for you guys on their behalf. So first I'll introduce Al. Um, Al Harmon Jr. is one of the North Slave Métis Alliance's board of directors. He's the treasurer um, and he's an avid hunter here in the North Slave region. He went to school in environmental sciences and is now works as an environmental scientist with SLR Consulting in Yellowknife. He's a strong advocate within NSMA for transfer of knowledge from elders to youth. He's a key provider of country foods to members, notably our elders, uh, whenever he harvests moose and caribou. And he's also a, a trusted boat driver, as you can see in this picture, when we do our monitoring during the summertime. He passes along his regrets for not attending, but he really looks forward to your questions and comments after the presentation. Next, we have Chloe Dragon-Smith. Chloe is passionate about relationships between lands and people. She has a degree in earth sciences, but she would say that she has learned most of what she knows from her family and her upbringing. Her work varies from on the land learning to indigenous led conservation to dealing with climate change. She's the co-founder of a, a super cool program called Bush Kids. Uh, it's a yellow knife based educational program bringing elementary school children outside for land based learning. She also has started her own consulting business called Babatsky with her partner. And uh, she is on the National Board of Nature Conservancy of Canada and also sat on the National Advisory Panel for the Pathway to Canada, Target One for Protected uh, Areas. So a very long list of accomplishments from Chloe here. Uh, and now we have Melissa on the line with us, so I will let her introduce herself. Oh my goodness. Okay. Uh, hi, I'm Melissa McClellan. I'm a member with the North State Métis Alliance. Um, sometimes I work there, sometimes I'm just a member. Right now I am in post-secondary school in Calgary, Alberta, so I am just a member. I don't work with them. Usually I am, when I am there, I am the junior environmental technician, so I help out with different um, sampling and assisting Jess most of the time or annoying Jess most of the time. Um, so I'm really excited to talk to all the aspiring students here and to educate everyone on the north so yeah thank you for having me awesome thanks melissa uh and finally i'll introduce myself so my name is jess herdebees um i am a non-indigenous person um, i work on the staff at nsma so i originally grew up in uh, just outside of ottawa and i studied marine biology and oceanography in halifax but I've always liked the cold more than the heat. So it was kind of a no brainer for me to move up to Yellowknife. Um, my university classes and co-op work terms are actually what got me learning more about indigenous communities across the North and the value between um, the value of bridging 
science with indigenous knowledge systems. Um, I've been working now at NSMA for about two years and it's just been an awesome experience and I can't wait to tell you more about the projects that we've had going on. All right, so just to situate ourselves because there's a lot of you guys coming from various parts of Canada, uh, where in the world are we? So we're in a few different places. Uh, Al and myself are in Yellowknife right now. Uh, like Melissa said, she's doing classes in Calgary. And Chloe is actually uh, just outside of the community of Fort Smith, NWT. And that's uh, just outside of Wood Buffalo National Park. Now, people think that the Northwest Territories are always just snow and cold, um, but it really isn't. Um, we do have our cold winters. And on the left, you can see a picture of uh, high noon sun time in December. Um, when it is the shortest days of the year. But on the right, you can see a lovely picture of uh, July summer a few years ago. And you can almost pretend like we're in the tropics with those turquoise colors. I will say that we have by far the best skies in all of Canada, but that might just be a little bit biased of me. Um, during the summertime, we have these incredible sunsets and uh, we are gifted with the lovely aurora during uh, most of the year when it's not too sunny. Now about the North Slave Métis Alliance. So it's a nonprofit organization that represents the Métis people in the North Slave region, which is just about Northeast of Great Slave Lake. NSMA members have ties to the Red River resistance with Louis Riel in Manitoba in the 1800s. And the Métis people mostly moved up to NWT through the fur trade in the 1800s. And then there's staff like myself who work on a whole assortment of projects to support uh, members. And that could be from caribou conservation to Métis rights and recognition uh, or engagement and consultation with mines and government. Our most uh, popular and biggest event that we hold during the year is Aboriginal Day on June 21st. Uh, you can see this picture of one of our board of directors who's sitting in a very uh, larger than life chair enjoying the sunshine. Uh, we have some lovely activities and crafts and traditional jigging dances during that day. And then just above it, you can see the Métis flag, which is uh, the infinity symbol, which represents the robust, adaptable, and everlasting presence of the Métis. So as a bit of an icebreaker uh, and follow up to Allison's question, we have a second question for you guys. So we want you to think about where you are in Canada or in North America. And um, so in North America, there are many, many hundreds of indigenous peoples. So the NSMA asserted territory, um, the, the territory that the Métis call home here, um, is a large component of the NWT. It even goes into Nunavut. Um, some other groups have land claims. They have traditional territory. Um, and in Canada, we usually refer to indigenous people as either Inuit, First Nations, or Métis. And what we want you thinking about is which traditional territory you are located on right now. So what Melissa is going to do is she is going to share a link to a website that we would like you to open up right now. It's called Native Land, and it shows overlapping traditional territories of Indigenous communities all across North America. So if you can take a look at that, find which territory you are located on right now, and then put those answers into the chat. So just to answer for us right now, we are obviously found on the asserted territory of the North Slave Métis Alliance, which isn't shown on this map, but the ones that are is uh, Denende, which is the traditional territory of the Keicho Nation, and also the Tlicho First Nation. So we look forward to seeing what you guys can find on this website. Excellent. So I can see that you guys are realizing that there's sometimes uh, many overlapping traditional territories. Um, and that's often the case because he said a lot of Indigenous peoples were migratory people, and there was a large area that they were moving across. So oftentimes, communities would cross paths, or at least be in shared areas. Awesome. 
All right, well, thank you guys for checking out this website. Please uh, continue looking at it at your leisure. Um, I find that it's a really interesting map to just learn a bit more about indigenous peoples in, in Canada and also on Turtle Island, which is the other traditional name for North America. All right, let's keep going here. All right, so this part was gonna be uh, from Al, but I'm going to present on his behalf here. So because we are talking about climate change, um, we are going to review a few things that we've been seeing in the North in uh, the last decade or so in regards to climate change impacts. So a lot of information goes around nowadays about how the Arctic is being impacted by climate change and how quickly it's changing. So you might hear stories like melting ice caps and skinny polar bears, um, but there have been quite a bit more ways that we've been feeling the change up here. So some ways uh, that we've been experiencing that is extreme highs and lows in water level. So now maybe Allison, can you tell me if you see my cursor on the screen? Sorry, I can't see your cursor. Okay, good. So on this top left corner uh, picture here, um, I took this past summer. So there's fixed, um, fixed tents on the shores here. And what's actually surprising is that this beach had another 20 feet on normal years. So the water is, is really, really high for this year. And that's been something that we were seeing more frequently in the North. Um, and it's, it's been causing things like increased erosion, um, destruction of cabins, just like these ones or just infrastructure in general. Um, we actually had two meters higher water level in Great Slave Lake this year, which is a lot of water considering how big Great Slave Lake is. Uh, another impact that we see is uh, longer ice-free periods and thinner ice. So this is just in um, Old Town of Yellowknife uh, during breakup, so when the ice is melting on Great Slave Lake. Uh, so one impact of climate change is that the ice is melting faster and uh, earlier. So Al shared a story with me that he's been having uh, more and more troubles traveling safely by snowmobile every year because the ice isn't setting properly. Um, it's moving a lot during this time of the year and more so into springtime. Um, and routes that were passed down in knowledge are just not so certain uh, whether or not they are safe. And this also impacts migratory species like caribou because they can't uh, use their migratory path safely, especially in northern parts of NWT on the Arctic Ocean because this ice is less uh, stable. Another impact of climate change is uh, wildlife moving north, uh, which Melissa will touch in a little bit later. Um, but essentially with increasing temperatures, species like moose and caribou are slowly moving northward or not coming quite so south as they usually do. Another one is melting or slumping permafrost. So in this bottom picture here, which uh, was taken more in the northern part of NWT, uh, you can see a lot of terrain that has just kind of slumped off of this hillside here. And what's happening is that the permafrost, which usually is a mix of soil and sediment and rock, and it's frozen in place, that water that has frozen in place is melting away. And then the sediment just slides along with it. And this is actually the, the reason for the title of our presentation, so Crooked Houses. So here in Yellowknife, uh, Melissa and I have some friends that the houses are slowly getting crooked and doors no longer fit in door frames because the permafrost under the houses is shifting and everything on top of it is shifting along with it. Another impact from climate change is increased in wildfires. So um, higher temperatures, I mean drier climates. So being in a almost Arctic desert here in the NWT, uh, it's already dry to begin with. And if you increase the temperatures, then the chances of wildfires also increases as well. Um, and this has been really impacting the lichen that caribou eat, um, which is also something that Melissa will touch on in a few minutes. The last impact from climate change that I'll touch on is, uh, I, I mentioned the heightened water levels and increased erosion. So this uh, satellite image is from last summer. We actually went out on the boat in Great Slave Lake, which is just, or sorry, Yellowknife Bay within Great Slave Lake. So this hole is Great Slave Lake here and Yellowknife Bay is just on the edge of these clouds up here. 
So essentially what happened is all of the sediment uh, from increased erosion was being pumped out of the South Slave River on the South shore of Great Slave Lake. And all of this brown material was the sediment that was being pumped from the river into the lake. And as time progressed, um, so the first picture was August 6th, this one is August 12th, you can see that the sediment itself is moving. The plume is, is spreading throughout Great Slave Lake until it finally makes its way all the way up to Yellowknife up here on August 21st. So that was a lot of sediment. It crossed 130 kilometers in two weeks. Um, so these are things that we're really concerned about, that, that community members are worried. How does the sediment impact fish? How does the water, is it safe to drink um, if you're, you're going out camping a ways away? All of these things uh, are questions that people are, are increasingly worried about. So I will now pass over the mic to Melissa, who will speak a little bit more to the second half of our title about uh, caribou and climate change impacts on them. All right, okay. So I'm going to be discussing caribou. Um, so I'll start with um, saying that the caribou are a very significant animal to everyone located up in the north. Um, the map on the right there shows all the different kinds of caribou in the Northwest Territories. Um, but as you can see, um, they don't have borders like we do. So they cross into the surrounding territories and provinces as well. Um, the Northside Métis Alliance is particularly concerned with the barren ground caribou. So that's the blue one on the map. Um, we're concerned with this one in particular because it's the one that um, our people have traditionally used due to their location and their range. Um, the barren ground caribou have been a great concern to people recently because they've been rapidly declining in numbers. Um, some of the reasons they've been rapidly declining is that their food source, um, lichen, has been affected by climate change. Um, so they are running out of food or it's just being affected. Um, another reason is that summers are becoming more and more unpredictable. Um, so that's when they calve. When there's more snow than expected, they can't blend in as well with their summer coats. So predators can easily spot them. Um, as well as there are lots of diamond mines and historical gold mines in the area, as well as other human development that affect the migration patterns of the caribou because they don't really want to be around people. Um, the North Slave Bay Tea Alliance is working alongside many groups right now to help protect the area and the caribou areas. Um, personally, I have gone on aerial surveys to count caribou while they're calving. And currently I am working with the Caribou Guardians Coalition to create a program where guardians from around the Northwest Territories can, and other provinces that um, are affected by the bare ground caribou can communicate their observations on them and make sure that people are following proper hunting guidelines. And we can go to the next slide. All right, and I'll be talking about Denago Wikahode as well. Um, so Denago Wikahode is an example of an indigenous led protected area. There are many groups involved in the collaboration and creation of this protected area. So it is located on the north arm of the Great Slave Lake as shown in the map on the left. So that entire area outlined in red is the potential protected area. We wanted to protect this area in particular because human development was ramping up in this region and it is traditionally very important to all the people that have lived there. The area is traditionally used as an entrance or a gateway into good hunting areas. So it's very important um, that we preserve the history that is there. It is also a very important area for migratory birds. While we were working to protect this area, we decided to take a different approach from most protected area projects. And we had most of our working group meetings and workshops out on the land of the protected area so that we could physically see, touch and smell what we were actually protecting. This way, when we brought elders out there with us, it was easier for them to tell us stories about the area. And many of them had actually not been out there in a very long time, despite living right next to it. Um, we felt that this was a great way to get the work done while we were out there because you actually want to protect places more when you're actually out there and you're seeing it. So yeah, <laughs> that's all for me on Denago with the Hode. Um, there was also a question about what type of development pressures were threatening the, uh, the protected area that was developed. Um, on the map, actually, if we're looking at the map of Denaga, on the 
lower right corner where the red kind of um, box is, there um, are stakes there for um, oil and gas, I believe, um, to be exported out of that area because of the beautiful beach that's there. It is a great spot for fracking. Um, but it's a really pretty area and it's a the particular beach is actually really, really important for hunting moose. Um, and it's a very sacred area for a lot of different um, groups. Um, including the North Lake Métis Alliance. Um, so by when they got those those stakes in there, they that is when they began to create the protected area. Okay, and then there's just a follow-up question of what is fracking? Um, so a, a type of mining. Yeah, it's a type of like extracting resources from the ground. Awesome, thank you so much for all your questions, everyone. Um, we've missed anything. I will reconfirm, Kat has given me the, the know-how to say that yes, in Canada, we categorize caribou in ecotypes, whether it's in NWT or otherwise. So thank you for clarifying that, Kat. Um, I will come back uh, for, so Nathan will answer your question as the last one before we move on for our next slides. So Nathan asked how many caribou die each year? Um, it's always a rough, estimate because caribou still are fairly elusive and it's hard to count them individually. Um, but at least in the NWT, it's uh, in the thousands every year now. Um, two of the, the herds that we, uh, that NSMA is most concerned about have decreased from upwards of 400,000 in the 80s, 1980s, and now are down to about 18,000. Uh, this year, and one of them down to 8,000. Um, so they're, they're rapidly declining. So it's in the, the hundreds and, and thousands every year. Um, I think someone just asked if Denaga Wicahote is drifting wood, if that's what it means. I think someone said that in there. Um, uh, Denaga Wicahote just means it's actually a name of the island in the very middle of the protected area. So we decided to call the whole area that because of the name of the, the island in the middle. So, yeah. <laughs> awesome. Okay, let's keep going here and we can uh, please post any other questions that you guys have and we can get back to them. All right. So I wanted to take a few minutes to talk about some of the projects that I've been leading uh, at NSMA. So um, we run a few programs that bridge Indigenous perspectives with Western science tools and monitoring um, practices. So more specifically, uh, water is such a huge part of life here in the NWT. We have many, many, many hundreds of lakes. Uh, as you can see from this aerial shot, there's just pockets of lakes across the whole territory. And um, water is just it's the source of life. Uh, it's precious and members care really deeply about its protection. So um, NSA members and NWT residents as a whole are definitely interested and concerned about water quality as well as preservation of traditionally important species in the territory. As such, um, I lead two pro projects that are related to these topics. The first being a community-based water monitoring program, which is a collaboration with the territorial government, and then a species at risk detection program using eDNA, uh, which is a really more newer tool in science. So let's start with the first program, the community-based monitoring. So um, for short, uh, we, we just call it the CBM and it's looking at water quality in the NWT. So the main goal of the CBM is to give community members the opportunity to learn how to do water monitoring, as well as answer some really important questions that they have about water in their communities. So these are questions like, can we drink the water? Is the quality of the water changing? Is water quality affecting the health of fish and wildlife? And are there cumulative effects like impacts from roads and mines that are impacting the water itself? So this map here on the left, although it's, it's really tiny, I know it's not the best map, um, it shows all of the places in the NWT that this program is running from. So we um, are just one little dot uh, for the Yellowknife water quality, part of a big 
territory-wide project. And we collect information on chemical, physical, and biological parts to get a, a sense of what water quality looks like in each area. So here are some pictures of us doing the CBM program. Um, you can see on the left here, this is actually, this is Al. He is setting up a YSI sond. So this device goes down into the water at specific depths and we can read things like temperature, pH, turbidity, dissolved oxygen, a whole bunch of different things. And then it gives you a nice picture of from the surface down to the bottom, what is the water quality looking like? And then in the middle up here, you can see Melissa is reading the YSI, uh, YSI sond reader to get the parameters um, that it's detecting as it's going down in the water column. The other component is we actually take scoops of water to do various tests on them. So this is Chloe here. She has just taken a water sample out in Yellowknife Bay. Um, and that sample itself will be sent to a lab and uh, they'll do a bunch of um, tests on it for further detections of metals and nutrients and all that kind of stuff. So all these results and that data, uh, what's really fun, what happens with it afterwards is it goes onto a website. And this website is called the Mackenzie Data Stream. And it's called such because we are in the Mackenzie watershed. So this website is really awesome. Um, I am very much, I nerd out over it all the time because it's super easy to use. You can look at graphs, you can slide things in and out if you wanna compare temperature to pH to um, the depth of where the sample was taken. And then you can easily download it into an Excel spreadsheet to do more work on it. So this is the, the power of this program. It gives communities another source of information that they can trust because they went out and took it themselves. And then it's also information that they can use to better understand what is happening in their environment. And then two, one fun thing is that oftentimes the government workers who are coming in to collaborate with the communities might not be as uh, comfortable or knowledgeable about the area. So community members are trusted boat drivers. They know this area like the back of their hands, how to safely travel out on the water and on the shores. Um, so it's a great partnership that way. Now, Melissa will share the Mackenzie Data Stream link in the comments if you guys want to go check that out at some point. And Jess, there's actually a question that lines up with what you're working on right now. Talking sure. About. Um, Jacqueline was wondering, um, have you modified any of these community-based monitoring programs in, in light of COVID or are they postponed? Uh, yeah. Sure, that is a great question. So um, we are very fortunate in the Neon WT that we haven't, we've been impacted by COVID, but definitely not to the extent of some of the Southern provinces. Um, so what's happening right now is the NWT has its borders closed to non-essential travel. Um, and if you do come into the territory, you have to self-isolate for two weeks. So anyone who lives here as a resident, um, it is fairly easy to move around. Um, like we wear masks, as you can see, uh, the, the picture on the the picture on the left on the right here of Chloe is from two summers ago, but the picture on the right on the left here, sorry, I'm getting my sides mixed up. The picture on the left here of Al and one of the GNWT workers was from last summer. So they're both wearing masks um, in this picture here. So we are allowed to go out and do the monitoring um, as long as participants are consenting and comfortable to be in those confined spaces. They have to wear masks. Uh, we still say distance when we can, um, but otherwise we have thankfully been able to continue the, the program, although it was delayed last summer from, instead of starting in June, we started in August because it took a little bit of time before we were able to get those logistics out. Um, so yeah, we've been a little bit luckier with that, but there's for sure a lot of paperwork involved and um, a lot of communication between communities and the government of the Northwest Territories to ensure everyone is staying safe and uh, following kind of social distance and disinfection protocols. Was there any other questions? Not that I see in the chat, wait. Oh, yes. Okay. Um, do you have issues with seasonal workers or summer students having to do a 14 day isolation? Um, if, if Great that's question. <laughs> yeah, thanks, Satsi. Um, so we haven't had any seasonal workers. Um, so far, Melissa has been our summer student and working into the fall 
before and she, as a resident, she didn't have to self-isolate. Um, typically when we do have anyone coming in with us for monitoring for this program like itself, like the CBM, um, we're getting members who are located here or staff at a, an SMA is doing it. Um, so we're not putting anyone at risk that way because they're already located here. And then Nathan was asking, do we go into Great Slave Lake for swimming? Yes, we do. It is cold though. <laughs> yeah, so like Melissa said, um, Great Slave Lake is a massive lake. So there's definitely like little pockets of places that people know are maybe safer or slightly warmer, um, but people definitely go swimming during the summertime. Um, and does your monitoring happen on the lake or also in rivers? Both. Uh, so we do mostly on Great Slave Lake, but we also have now started doing monitoring on the Yellowknife River, which is a river that flows into Great Slave Lake. So we get a bit of a sense of what's happening upstream in Yellowknife Bay and then on the, um, the little or the reaches of where Yellowknife Bay opens up into Great Slave Lake. Okay, great. Um, one person did ask about past results and the, would the uh, direction be go to that link that was sent out and you can look at the year over year. Sure. Result. Yeah, I think the best bet would be to go check out the McKenzie data stream for uh, results. I actually haven't um, gotten any from this past year yet, uh, just because that information gets processed by the government of the Northwest Territories. But usually within the following year, we get a little bit of synopsis of what's, uh, what's been happening. Um, but yeah, go check out the McKenzie data stream. Okay, and then the last question would be, um, what are the specific parameters you're monitoring for when you're taking your So I did have a whole list of them originally in my presentation, but then I took them out because I was uh, getting a little long on time. But some of them that I remember off the top of my head are pH, temperature, dissolved oxygen, chlorophyll, um, and then we have a whole list of heavy metals. Um, we have also a test that detects any, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Essentially like if there's any oil seepage into the area, so it'll detect those organic materials that are in oil. Um, then usually just the standard, what time of the day, when are we going out? Because those parameters change over the course of the season as well. Usually we, we would go from July until about mid-September. Um, yeah, those are the main ones that I, I can remember off the top of my head for parameters that we're testing for. Oh, that's great. I think you mentioned at 1.2 eDNA. I don't know if that's specific. Yeah, that's the next, the next slide. <laughs> Ignore me. <laughs> All right, sounds good. I will proceed to the next one just for now, just based on time here. Okay, so the second project that I mentioned was uh, species detection, species at risk detection and eDNA. So uh, wildlife is suffering the impacts of climate change and human development, as we spoke about a bit earlier. And with NWT being such a huge landmass with so few people, it is quite difficult to get a big picture of how species are doing in the territory. Um, but Indigenous people know this land best, as well as the wildlife and the plants that live here, um, and they know how to travel safely out on the land. So we've been trying to push really for these, these guardianship programs, like Melissa mentioned, and Indigenous stewardship, where we're getting the people doing the work who know this land best. Um, so just for context, uh, for, for how big the land is here in NWT compared to other places. So Ontario has about 14.1 people per square kilometer. Um, so that's about a million square kilometers of area with 13 million people. If you compare that to the NWT, we have just about the same amount of area, so about a million square miles in area, but only 40,000 people live in the territory. So uh, that's only 3.7 people per square kilometer. So that's, again, just a huge amount of land with very few people. Um, so a lot of the species up here that are listed federally under the Species at Risk Act are deemed data poor in the eyes of science, but that doesn't mean that they are because there is a lot of indigenous knowledge that just isn't represented in, um, in this work. So about two years ago, we launched a project to try and understand what, what is happening to species at risk like bison, caribou, least cisco fish, and uh, western toad. 
So many species in the NWT are at risk from climate change and human development, like we said. Um, but uh, we, we want to bring in that indigenous knowledge about them. So how does eDNA work? So eDNA is short for environmental DNA. It's uh, all of these animals, they shed skin, there's blood, there's feces, there's other biological matter that goes into water ways. Um, and it's that DNA is known as environmental DNA. You can think about it a bit about almost like the dust that accumulates in your house, that that would be technically eDNA. So what we can do is we go collect a water sample, we run it through a really, really fine mesh that can then pick up that DNA. And then you run it through a lab test and it can tell you all of the species that are in that body of water, as well as in the surrounding area for a very specific amount of time. And what's great about it is that it's non-invasive, which means that we don't actually have to see the wildlife or interact with it to be able to detect it. And thus that prevents stress on the animals themselves. So here you can see some pictures of us doing the eDNA the last two summers. So Al has just taken a ladle full of water into the sample bag. And then what we do is we push the sample through the capsule, which has that very, very fine mesh paper that will capped the DNA. Um, or sometimes we do it with a really fancy drill that has a pump on it, um, saves us a bit of muscle power. And then we can send that paper off to a lab to do the tests. And then they send us a list of all of the animals that we've detected in that area. So this type of project is really interesting as another tool of understanding because science as itself is, is our tools for understanding. They're not the be, be all end all of knowledge. Um, so they're a tool to indigenous knowledge on understanding um, the traditional lands. So it can help understand the changes of the land that NSMAs are living on, how uh, the wildlife is moving in or away from an area they were known to occupy, just like how Melissa was explaining that caribou and moose are moving northward. So wildlife movement out of traditional harvesting areas has severe impacts on the community. For example, um, members have to travel farther than they normally do to go hunting and trapping, and that can cost more money the farther, further and further away they go. Um, and that can prevent them from continuing traditional practices that they've passed on from generations to generations. So these pictures here are areas that are traditionally important to members that they identified that we needed to go do sampling for. Now I see that there's a whole bunch of pictures and I'm at the end of my little bit on eDNA. So let's hop on to those ones. I see that Melissa has been doing a good job of answering some of them. So let me just see if I can pick one up here. Um, sorry, I'm just scrolling up. So being from Barrie, can you compare the size of Great Slave Lake to Lake Ontario? Ontario, Is it larger or smaller? That is a good question. Let's see if I can, I don't know if I can, I don't have my Googling capabilities while I'm in speaker presentation, but uh, maybe Melissa, can I get you to figure uh, out? I did, if... I did look it up. Um, it's sure. uh, much bigger. <laughs> <laughs> Great Slave Lake is much bigger. <laughs> Sorry, I'm just trying to get them to chat in again. Okay. Um, uh, there was a question that we passed asking, um, can, have, are you aware of any invasive species that are doing particularly well as a result of changing conditions? Great question. Um, I'm trying to think. Um, um, ticks are doing really well in certain species, so especially moose. Um, they're becoming harder and harder to hunt because once you find a moose, um, they're covered in ticks now. That's one that I can think of off the top of my head that's really bad. And mosquitoes. <laughs> Great question. Uh, have we studied Lake Simcoe? We have not studied Lake, Lake Simcoe. Um, what other questions? Um, Someone asked, um, they haven't heard of eDNA and they're wondering if it's a relatively new technology. Um, sure. Well established. So um, from my understanding, eDNA has come up as a monitoring tool probably in the last 10 years or so. Um, so there's, there's two different types of eDNA sampling. 
one where you are sampling and looking for one specific species. So you'd be going out and be like, I want to know whether or not there is just Western toad in this lake, or I want to know if there is lake trout in this lake. Um, so that test, um, you would go in, take the water sample, bring it back, run it through the lab and compare it to the one DNA sequence. And then you'd be able to tell whether or not that species is present. Whereas the second one, uh, it's called meta barcoding. And that one is the one that we do where you have a database of all of these different strains of DNA. And then once you take your water sample, you compare it to that database and it'll tell you, bing, 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 all of the species that have been detected in your water sample. So that one is really neat because you get a lot of information off of it, but it's only as strong as how much DNA you have in your database. So we're actually partnering with a lab in France and they don't have a lot of the species uh, DNA that we have here in the NWT. So we actually have to send off some blood and tissue samples for our bison, our caribou and toad in order for them to tell us whether or not we were detecting those species in this area. Um, and what we really liked as a nonprofit is that this company was really helpful in giving us all the equipment and helping us do the analysis afterwards and one fail swoop. But there's a lot of universities in Canada that do the barcoding for the one species. Um, and notably in Ontario, there's a few of them as well as BC. Chloe Dragon Smith Sits e ama Brenda Dragon Hulier. Sits e aba Leonard Smith Hulier. Hello everyone. I'm Chloe Dragon Smith. Um, I introduced myself to you in my family's language, which is Dene Saintline. Another word for that is Chippewan, and we come from the southern Northwest Territories and kind of northern Saskatchewan, northern Alberta. But we used to travel extensively all through the north following the caribou so all the way up through the yellow knife area and up to the tundra i'm sorry i can't be with you today i had something come up um, but i was really looking forward to talking with you and so i thought i would send along this little recording um, i know the presentation is about climate change and i do a lot of climate change work and thinking in my daily life I've been living out on the land full time for a year now, and it's true that we're seeing all kinds of strange weather and effects on our homelands. What I find, though, in my work and my day to day is that climate change can be looked at as a set of impacts for sure, and I find that we often are having that lens to climate change and documenting and recording and monitoring and that's very important but I find that we miss a core part of the conversation which is why are we having the issue of climate change in the first place and for me as an Indigenous person in my own worldview um, climate change is not a primary problem it's actually a symptom of the way that we live our lives which is very disconnected from the land and what sustains us all directly, no matter where we come from. Um, so we see lots of other symptoms that come like food insecurity and uh, economic disruption and difficulties with health. Like for instance, the coronavirus that we've been dealing with this past year. So I see all of these things in the same lens as climate change and with a with a very foundational root problem and it's that we are not connected to the systems that we rely on anymore and it's you know it's it's simple but it's very very powerful and i um i think that each of us can do our part for climate change by recognizing that and even in our own lives spending time outdoors and connecting with the land where we are even if you're in a city uh, there's land is everywhere and um, I think that making those steps in our own lives and helping others to be more connected is a is a major frontline uh, climate change mitigation strategy that we don't think about in those terms 
And in the North and the advocacy I do, I'm always talking about the need for funding and climate change funding to go to programs that are connecting people with land and helping to revitalize culture and intertwined living with our ecosystems. Because, you know, even if we had a huge technological miracle to get us out of this climate change debacle, um, I truly think that we would only have another problem quite quickly down the road if we're not solving the root of the problem. And so to me, that looks like empowering and supporting people who do still live closely with the land and who have the capacity to understand our relationship with land. And that is most often Indigenous peoples across Canada and certainly in the North, um, but I know across Canada as well. Um, so that's my view on climate change. I, I wrote a paper about it that you can find online and I'll attach a link with Jess so that you guys can read a little further on it if you want. Um, Tahuna for listening and thank you all for your interest and your time in supporting solutions and looking to a more sustainable future. And again, I thank you for joining. I think we have a couple more minutes. So I did flag one or two questions, Jess, if you are still, if you still have time. Um, one of them was, are there any community training options for learning eDNA for people on the land? Good question. Um, so one that is a more basic like monitoring program that's available federally is the CABIN training. Um, it's an acronym, it stands for C-A-B-I-N. I just can't remember what the acronym itself stands for, but if you Google CABIN, uh, they do a lot of work on monitoring, um, learning how to monitor like creeks and invertebrates and all the little things that are in water. In terms of eDNA itself, um, I'm less familiar about programs that you could find online to learn how to do them, but I would really like to look into that. So perhaps I can try and find some information that can be shared uh, with the post recording. Well, I'm muted. Yes, we can definitely um, send out any links that you think are useful after. Um, Jess, I just sent you one that is maybe the cab cabin training you were talking about. If it is, we can share in the chat. Okay, great. Um, all right, so um, again, thank you to our speakers. Thank you to everyone who took the time out of the evening to join us. Um, if you have another question, um, there is a minute or two. So if you just pop it into the chat, we can keep an eye on it. Um, otherwise, like I said, this is recorded. We'll be editing it to take out some of the pauses and, and throw in that um, audio file. So it might take a little while, but it'll come out. Uh, we'll let everyone know by email but when it's when it's live. We did uh, want to say, folks, we did actually just skip one slide at the end that Melissa was going to touch to you about post-secondary options um, that you guys can look into if you're thinking about university or college, um, some places that work specifically in the NWT or um, are just on environmental sciences in general. And please check out their programs because they do a lot of fantastic work up here. And Melissa, if there was anything that you wanted to summarize real quick for, for that, sorry. <laughs> um, do you want me to just name off all the post-secondary? Post sure. um, so there is Aurora College, which is located in the Northwest Territories in Yellowknife, um, but there's different um, sext of the school well, within the Northwest Territories. Um, it's about to become a polytechnic university. Um, another school that you could go to if you were interested in helping is Wilfrid Laurier and um, the University, uh, Carleton University. Um, they both have collaborations with the GNWT and other places um, in the Northwest Territories that are um, on climate change specifically. There's also the University of Calgary, which is where our coworker Kat went, who has been in the chat. Um, their um, veterinary department uh, works with caribou and musk oxen. So. Yeah, those are some options uh, if you're interested in post-secondary and um, interested in the North and climate change. Awesome, thanks, Melissa. I'll grab one, one or two and Allison just tell me if we have to hop off.
just due to Zoom. Um, I saw, is there a lot of community interest in the program? How do you encourage more participation? Uh, we've definitely been growing the interest. Um, so the first year that I did it, I had about five or six members come out for the eDNA uh, versus, and then this past summer was kind of a, a tough year because we started so late in the season due to COVID limitations. Um, but we have uh, um, about two dozen people that kind of rotate through for the water monitoring and eDNA. Um, and it's really just through word of mouth. I send a lot of newsletters online. We call people to out of our membership. Um, and then we have little workshops to try and describe to folks what we do and how we're doing it. And also to get feedback. I think that's the most important part is if members feel like they can give input and help shape the project itself, then they definitely want to contribute to it and participate. Um, we also have a support program for funds for folks to come out with us for their time to get paid too. That's a big component because a lot of them are taking it out of their busy days to come help us do these projects. So um, that is funding through usually federal or territorial governments. How are we doing for time, Allison? Uh, so technically um, we're past eight, but uh, Zoom should let us keep going um, for a little bit longer if there's another question you wanted to answer. It's just more about who stays on. Okay, sounds good. Uh, there's a question here saying, is there poaching in Canada? Um, unfortunately, sorry, is there hunting or poaching? I think I'm assuming Nathan, you want to know if there is um, poaching going on. Unfortunately, there is. Um, and we try to have programs through the either through the government enforcing proper harvesting practices. Um, but we also have programs that are run by ourselves. So our colleague Kat actually runs a program where we have Indigenous guardians that go out. So folks go out onto into areas that should be protected to monitor them and prevent any illegal hunting of caribou in this instance. And then what is good to study in school for the type of work you do? Um, so I think any general environmental sciences, right now you can actually sign up to most universities for environmental sciences, or you can do biology and then go more specifically into um, environment related work. I did more aquatic biology versus um, Kat did more terrestrial biology. Um, so it's you kind of start off biology in your first few years and then you go through. You could also do geography. Um, you could do anthropology because you learn about the history of peoples and um, locations that are important to how human history has evolved. Um, so there, there's a lot of different ways that you can come through at, come through this. Um, but uh, yeah, it really depends kind of what branch you would like to have. And I'd be happy to answer more questions if you did have uh, more queries about university life and how to get into um, this type of work. All right, I think that was most of the questions. I do apologize if we missed anyone. Um, but you guys were so participating and we greatly appreciate the time that you took, especially those um, outside of in more of the eastern parts of Canada and North America. Um, we know that it's, it's a late time on a Thursday night, but this was a great discussion and we really hope that you were able to learn something tonight. Well, um, thank you for all the expertise uh, that you that you and Melissa and um, Alan and uh, Chloe put into this presentation. It was very informative. I know I learned something. Um, and if anybody has any questions that weren't responded to, just let me know. Um, when I send out my follow up email, that's like nudge nudge to do the survey, and then um, I can always we can connect and we can get those answers out to anyone that needs them by email. Uh, all right, so then. Thanks again to everyone. Uh, have a have a great night, and uh, maybe we'll see you next webinar. Excellent. Thank you, everyone.